As you can see, the talk is on inequality and public opinion. Uh, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the U.S., but I also have some data from other countries that I'm going to share just to put the U.S. Uh, in some comparative context, especially uh, in the beginning of the talk. So the two objectives uh, for this talk um, is the first to question American exceptionalism with data. Um, Looking at uh, sources of data that are not typically analyzed by researchers, uh, I have found inconsistencies, I think, in uh, public, the public's positions on multiple issues, particularly related to uh, the American dream ideology, which is an ideology about economic opportunity, as well as free market ideologies, which are about Americans' uh, perceptions of uh, the free market and the extent to which they believe there should or should not be intervention in the free market. I also look at perceptions of and preferences for economic redistribution, either by the government or by major companies, which is what I'm going to talk about later in the talk. So I focus on perceptions of three concepts, inequality, opportunity, and redistribution. I also want to uh, propose an integrated framework for understanding public views of inequality, opportunity, and redistribution, and generate new data to test it. So one of the main arguments that I'm going to make is that our data, our existing data that we have to analyze these issues, uh, is actually very rudimentary. Uh, we have a lot of assumptions about the way people think. We just assume Americans <laughs> believe in the American dream rather than testing to see whether they believe in the American dream. We assume that Americans are free marketers, uh, that they uh, hold very dearly to ideas of non-intervention in the market and are, and are opposed to government, all kinds of government intervention. But we don't actually examine data closely to determine whether that is actually true. So that is uh, really at the center um, of my research agenda. And I also hope that uh, these ideas can spread potentially to other countries, can be applicable to other countries. My, one of my collaborators is here, Arvid Lin, from uh, the, the Stockholm University in Sweden, of course. Um, and he has worked very hard to be able to get some of our new questions on uh, the premier uh, comparative data set on social attitudes that is fielded in, how many countries is it fielded in? 45? 35. 35? 35 countries, um, okay, <laughs> uh, around the world. So we have some new questions that are going to be fielded in what are called the social inequality modules in 2019 in many countries and also in the U.S. in 2020. Um, I'm actually going to be showing you data from the International Social Survey Program uh, from earlier uh, modules, social inequality modules in earlier years, because it's not uh, uh, actually fielded uh, every year. In fact, it's fielded every 10 years. Uh, so, you know, we really do have very little uh, data to work from. But I'm going to show you what we do have. So this is from the International Social Survey Program. I'm going to call it ISSP for short from here on. This is from the year 2000, and the reason why it's from the year 2000 is because that's the last year in which Canada participated in the survey, and Canada is uh, what you would call the closest country comparison to the U.S. So it's very useful, very similar political institutions and economic institutions, so it's useful to compare the U.S. Uh, to Canada as well as to other uh, high-income countries. And I have a few of these listed here, uh, but I also have the median value for this particular question, which I'm going to um, uh, describe in a moment. Uh, but uh, the, the data set that is available here consists of about a dozen countries, even though I've only got about half dozen uh, represented here, just to illustrate the values for uh, some specific countries. So this is the this is the question the question on uh, perceptions and preferences for uh, economic redistribution by the government. And the question asks whether the government it's the government's responsibility to reduce the gap between high and low incomes. And what you can see here is that the U.S. 
Uh, this, this indicates, the bars indicate strong agreement and agreement to this question. And the U.S. is really an outlier when it comes to support for government redistribution. As you can see, only 35% of Americans support uh, redistribution by the government. And uh, that's relative to a median of 59% across the dozen countries, and then also lower, to, lower than Canada. Now, based on this particular question, this is the main question that's analyzed in comparative research, it is inferred, based on theories of revealed preferences, that Americans are very tolerant of inequality. If they weren't tolerant of inequality, if they cared about the issue, if they were concerned about it, then they would support government redistribution of income through the tax, primarily through the tax and transfer system. Another piece of evidence that's used to support this argument that Americans uh, are tolerant of inequality because they don't support uh, policies to redistribute income is this question. It's a slightly different question than the one that I showed you in the prior slide. Uh, it's a more detailed question. I'm actually going to show you the text of it um, a little bit later on in the talk. And here, it's, uh, this is an answer um, that is coded on a scale from one to seven with higher values indicating greater support for redistribution. And as you can see, there's been a, a very flat trend over time in, uh, in preferences for redistribution. So in other words, there's been no increase in support for government redistribution over a period in which inequality has increased dramatically in the United States, okay? Um, as you all probably know, levels of inequality are among the highest um, of all high-income countries in the United States, as well as Great Britain. Uh, so the U.S. has both high levels of inequality and uh, increasing levels of inequality. Yet, there's no response by the public uh, for a demand for greater redistribution. And this level, as you can see, it's not a very high level of support for redistribution among Americans as well. Uh, so, uh, low relative to other countries comparatively, and hasn't increased over time. These are the facts that everyone focuses on to uh, draw conclusions about American perceptions of and preferences regarding issues of economic inequality. However, once we uh, start looking at some other questions, uh, and I'm going to return to redistribution uh, later in the talk, I'm going to switch now to attitudes about inequality itself. So not about government redistribution of income, but about just about inequality. And this particular question has, uh, is framed in the, way, in, in the way that's in the title here. It asks, are income differences too large uh, in America, in this case? Uh, and whether or not uh, individuals agree or strongly agree with that question, um, or that statement, rather. It's income differences are too large in America. Do you agree or strongly agree? Uh, out of five categories. And so here I'm uh, presenting data for strongly agree and agree broken out. Uh, and what you see here is that the U.S. is no longer an outlier. Uh, you have two-thirds of Americans that believe that income differences are too large. This is about the same as the median across these dozen or so countries, and it's very similar to Canada. I want to, again, emphasize that the level of inequality is higher in the U.S., so you might expect that they would be even more concerned about inequality than in other countries, okay? But I'm going to put that aside for now, and, and let's just look at this comparison across these questions. So definitely an outlier in the sense of not supporting redistribution um, uh, as much as in other countries, but not an outlier when it comes to uh, being concerned about levels of income uh, inequality being too large. When we look at uh, data on earnings, so that question was about income inequality. When we look at data on earnings, these data also come from the ISSP in the year 2000, uh, as well as in 2010. Um, and this is uh, focusing only on the U.S., and let me explain this data a little bit. Uh, what we have here are questions about uh, asking people to give their estimate of how much CEOs, uh, chief executive officers of a large corporation earn annual earnings, and then also how much unskilled workers earn annual earnings. Uh, and then we also, uh, the respondents are also asked 
how much these two individuals in these two occupations should earn. That's in the red bars. So in the blue bars is their estimate, the median estimate um, of how much they should make. Uh, I mean, how much they do make. And in the red bars is the median estimate of how much they should make. And what I want to focus on here uh, on the left side, the left panel of the graph, are the ratios. Okay, so the ratios of uh, estimated executive pay to ex estimated worker pay is sort of an estimate of how much inequality people think is in the labor market. Uh, this is a typical measure of inequality, uh, the ratio of executive pay to worker pay. And you'll see in 2000, that was 13 to 1. And then in 2010, it increased. So there was this perception of increasing inequality uh, to 32 to 1 ratio of executive to worker pay. Uh, now, just to give you a sense of what uh, actual uh, inequality is, uh, the ratio of executive to worker pay, it's about 300 to 1. Now, this fact, this discrepancy between American estimates of the, this gap, this ratio, and the actual level, uh, which is much higher, um, of inequality between executives and workers, this discrepancy is often used to argue that um, if only Americans knew just how extreme inequality was, then they would support greater redistribution. So this is an information story, right? If, if only Americans had more information, better information about the level of inequality, then they may support redistribution um, in greater numbers. However, if we look at the desired pay and pay ratios, we have a desired pay ratio of 4 to 1 in 2000 and 7 to 1 in 2010. Now, these are extremely unrealistic levels of desired inequality. There will never be a level of inequality in the U.S. that is 7 to 1. Okay, so what we actually have here, I think, is um, not a problem of information because the desired levels of inequality are already unrealistically low. If they had more information, in fact, if they had more information about how high the level of inequality is, I doubt very much that their desired level of inequality would be much lower, because it already is so low. So the problem with the information, the misinformation argument, is that people often infer from the misinformation that if there were more and better information, then there would be a different response. But we show that, in fact, that is an incorrect inference, that people already desire much lower inequality than they perceive to exist. On the right side of this graph is data from uh, a very unusual, unique survey, a representative survey of the top 1% of wealth holders in the city of Chicago that was conducted by my former colleague at Northwestern, Benjamin um, Page and colleagues. And what he did was ask this, uh, uh, this um, sample a representative sample, very, very hard to collect data on this population. Uh, so it was very expensive even to survey 100 individuals in the top 1% in Chicago. And they were asked these same questions. And interestingly, they estimated a higher ratio of 20, a 93 to 1. So they are more knowledgeable. Um, however, the people who are more knowledgeable also tend to be people who support higher uh, degrees of inequality. So you'll see that their desired ratio was 50 to 1. But it's interesting still, nevertheless, that uh, even those in the top 1% uh, actually um, support uh, a reduction in levels of inequality between executives and workers. Let me move to the issue of opportunity and how Americans view issues of economic opportunity. And what we have here are some questions also from the ISSP. And uh, on the left-hand side of the chart, you have information about how important hard work is and getting ahead. So this is our measure of, of views about economic opportunity. What are the factors that are most important in getting ahead? And one of the questions asks how important is hard work in getting ahead? Uh, and the, there's a, it's a five-response uh, scale, and here I have shown the percent that respond that it's either essential or very important to getting ahead. And you see in the U.S. that uh, virtually everyone says that hard work is essential or very important to getting ahead. Um, the red star indicates 
the share from that top 1% survey. Okay, so about 90% of those in that Chicago-based top 1% survey uh, say that hard work is very important uh, in getting ahead. Now, this is higher than other countries, but notice that the, the share of individuals in other countries who believe hard work is important to getting ahead is also quite high. Okay, now compare this to the right side of the graph, which is asking a more structurally oriented uh, question about whether or not there are structural barriers to people getting ahead. So hard work is about an individual's own effort. Uh, but let's just say you come from a wealthy family, which is a question I don't have here, but I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, or your parents have uh, a high education. That's actually one of the strongest determinants of your own success, is your parents' <coughs> education. And when we ask about how important that factor is, we get uh, a level of response in the United States that is as high or higher than in other countries that are comparable. Uh, and so what we are finding here, so the median, for example, is 31% say that parents' education is essential or very important in getting, getting ahead, whereas in the U.S. it's 49%. And we see the same pattern with a question that asks about how important is coming from uh, a wealthy family. Also, as high or higher in the United States than in other countries and, and well above the median of those other countries. The red star, by the way, is the share of the top 1%. Uh, sample saying that parents' education is very important, and that is 20%. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to show you the question about coming from a wealthy family, but only 1% of the top 1% sample thinks that coming from a wealthy family is very important or essential for getting ahead. Okay. Now, I emphasize this because um, it is also often said that Americans think just like the rich. That's why they don't favor redistribution, is because they, they think they're going to be rich themselves someday, and that they themselves sort of take on the attitudes and views of the rich, okay? Here we see that that may be the case when it comes to hard work, but not when it comes to uh, perceiving structural barriers to getting ahead, such as uh, being lucky to have a parent with a high education or with a high income. Um, now, uh, I want to switch gears a little bit here and talk about the U.S. and trends over time. Uh, we have here a question that was asked in the United States. Um, and what we find here is, this is a question, um, let me back up a bit, this is a question about optimism about upward mobility, so it taps into uh, this notion of the American dream. And it asks, the way things are in America, people like me and my family have a good chance of improving our standard of living. And you'll see that most people do agree, uh, or strongly agree to this question, okay? And so in some ways that does, um, uh, follow the pattern that we expect of Americans kind of believing, uh, perhaps blindly, in, in the American dream. Um, however, you'll see that it varies over time. And in particular, that it has declined uh, consistently since the late 1990s. There was an economic boom in the late 1990s in the U.S. And inequality did decline slightly. Uh, or plateaued um, in the late 1990s. But then you see a steady decline since that point. So less optimism now, and over the past virtually 20 years, uh, a declining trend um, in optimism about upward mobility. So this is not something that's static, right? So belief in the American dream is not something that is just uh, a static belief um, but something that can be manipulated or that can change according to changes in the economic and social and, in fact, political context. This is then uh, a, a measure of uh, policy preferences that I think is related to the issue of, of economic opportunity. And this is, uh, and we want to contrast this to the question about uh, support for government redistribution, which is the typical question that's used to assess Americans' view about uh, inequality and the desire for reducing inequality through government redistribution. This is an alternative question about policy, and it's also about government spending, but it's about government spending on education uh, and whether or not that spending should be increased. 
And what you see here is, contrary to the level of support for government redistribution, you have a very high level of support for spending on education. And this level of support has increased over time, uh, especially in the 1980s. It's been relatively flat at a very high level since that point. Uh, some other research that I've done shows that there has been an increasing association between concerns about inequality and support for greater spending on education. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the conclusion, but I think one uh, implication of this is that Americans might tend more towards a sort of social investment model um, of social policy than a strictly uh, redistributive model of tax and transfer policy. Okay, I'm going to skip some of the, uh, the anecdotal evidence. I'm happy to come back to it um, uh, uh, in the Q&A period. Um, okay, so summarizing across, I know there's a lot of data, but I wanted to touch on uh, perceptions of redistribution, perceptions of inequality, and perceptions of economic opportunity, and to try to put these together into an integrated framework, which we call the opportunity model of beliefs about inequality and redistribution. And the, the idea is this, is that rising in high levels of inequality are salient or become most salient when they're perceived as restricting economic opportunity. Right? So this suggests that these views can change, that American dream ideology can be questioned, can be put into question, and we suggest it's being put into question by uh, rising economic inequality and the particular pattern of rising economic inequality that we see in the U.S., which consists of stagnating uh, or even declining earnings among workers in the middle and at the bottom of the distribution, while earnings at the top uh, 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 increase sharply. Uh, so there's been a great concentration of income at the top, uh, while there have been declines in earnings, real earnings, um, adjusted for inflation, uh, in the bottom of the distribution and at the middle of the distribution, and even among families. So even when we look at pooled income, we see stagnant or declining household income over time since the late 1990s. Okay, so that's the first part, that uh, there's this response to um, economic, uh, rising economic inequality, that that is perceived as restricting economic opportunity. So our hypothesis is that inequality should, re should reduce beliefs uh, in equal opportunity. Now, let me emphasize that the, that the dominant perspective on this is that Americans believe in inequality, and if anything, if they see uh, that inequality is fair, the Americans believe that inequality is fair, and if anything, the way they would respond to rising levels of inequality is to work harder, right, in order to reap the huge rewards that you get in an unequal society and economy. Okay, so that is, that is really the standing uh, hypothesis and theory about the way Amer Americans think about inequality, that it's a motivator. Uh, and uh, it should motivate even more when the rewards are so high. Our alternative is the opposite. It's, some people have called it the rigged economy perspective. You know, people are becoming more skeptical as inequality increases and all the rewards are concentrated at the top, at the top that uh, economic success is, is no longer available openly to all who seek it through hard work. Okay, so the second part I think is important. We're, we're going to get back to this issue of redistribution. And so the second part of the model is that if people are concerned about economic opportunities, they're concerned about the consequence of economic inequality in terms of it restricting uh, economic opportunities, then the kinds of policies that they'll support would be policies that are uh, transparently opportunity-enhancing policies. Uh, and we argue that uh, those types of policies are policies that, that enhance or expand educational opportunity and that expand labor market opportunity. So employment opportunities as well, and not just jobs, but good jobs and jobs with benefits, uh, uh, health care, uh, pensions, uh, daycare, um, family leave, all these kinds of employment supporting policies. These are the kinds of policies that we think are associated with uh, greater opportunity for economic, um, uh, increasing one's economic uh, livelihood or security um, in the labor market. Now, the alternative uh, hypothesis, this H2A, is that uh, really support for social redistribution is the only um, valid uh, response to a concern about inequality. And I, and I noted that at, at the beginning of the talk. Uh, the other part of this is this 
idea that Americans would not be interested in reducing the earnings gap between, say, executives and workers um, because they don't believe in any intervention in the free market. There should be no socially based or socially motivated intervention in the free market. That would be strictly against free market ideology. So if Americans are indeed free market ideologues, then we would not expect them to support uh, uh, any kind of redistribution of earnings uh, in the labor market. Um, and, and let me also say that there's kind of a corollary here that when most people think about Americans as being opposed to government redistribution, they also think of Americans as being against any kind of government intervention of any kind, uh, so generally anti-government, that, that usually that, that that view is associated also with a pro-free market orientation. It's as if those two go hand in hand. If you're against the government, then you're also against any kind of uh, intervention in the, in the market that is non-profit uh, maximizing. That's going to be important for how we measure uh, this form of labor market redistribution, a new question that we're introducing that we suggest does not show that Americans are strictly free market ideologues in that sense, that they do in fact support some interventions in the market to create greater equality. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna present uh, this new data that, um, that I talked about in the beginning of this talk, uh, and it's based on two papers. Uh, the first is, was published uh, about a year and a half ago, but we're continuing to do follow-up studies and replications, and I, I will talk a little bit about those as well, as well as to prevent, uh, uh, present the, um, the setup of these experiments. And then the second uh, paper is uh, not yet published. It's under review. And again, my collaborator, Arvid Lind, is here. Uh, and we are, are in the midst of uh, uh, revising this paper, or potentially will be revising this paper, so we're very happy for feedback on that um, as well. And that's going to focus on the issue of redistribution specifically. Our new measure of redistribution in the labor market is what, is what we're calling it. Okay, so the survey experiments, quickly, let me uh, set this up for you. Um, so, so what we're trying to do is, uh, is try to better understand how people are responding to the issue of economic inequality. As I said, our hypothesis is, is that they have concerns about uh, the ability to get ahead and, and to have greater economic opportunity, that those are being restricted. Uh, but surprisingly, there have not been any studies that have tried to isolate this particular uh, kind of um, uh, priming or uh, is making information about economic inequality salient? Like, what kind of reaction will that have? Uh, so we have a very simple treatment, a very short, descriptive, realistic article on trends and inequality over time in the U.S. It's taken from the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan research arm of the U.S. Congress. It's like a uh, press release from one of their important studies on the issue. And then we have a control condition that is of a similar format, uh, but it's on baseball, trends in baseball statistics. So it's uh, the same sort of heavily statistical information. Um, and then our first set of dependent variables actually uh, are the questions that I showed you about what are the most important factors in getting ahead. Are they you know, uh, individual factors such as hard work and ambition? Or are they more structurally oriented uh, factors such as parents' education and, and, uh, and the wealth um, of the, the, uh, the family that someone comes from? Uh, and then the second set of dependent variables are these questions about government redistribution or redistribution in the labor market. This is the treatment. There's a graph that accompanies uh, the treatment. This is real data, although we've changed the end point a little bit because we're continuing to do research on this. Um, these data, I think, officially end maybe around 2007. So as you can see that uh, the respondents will, will see that there has been income growth throughout the distribution from 1979 to 2015, let's just say, um, but that much greater income growth uh, for the top 1% of the distribution. And this is taken directly from the CBO. And then we have this very short article. So we, are, we consider this a very uh, mild treatment. We're not doing anything fancy to try to catch the attention uh, of the respondents. And uh, I won't go through it, but it just, it just uh, in, in text, 
uh, in narrative form goes through the results of the, uh, of the chart with the differential growth rates throughout the distribution of the top, middle, and bottom. And our results are that uh, the uh, treatment effects are in the dark and the black bars, and the gray bars are the control. And these are levels of support for those questions that I showed you about the importance of individual factors in getting ahead and the uh, importance of structural factors in getting ahead with their scales with a couple items in each. And what we find here is that there are significant differences between the control and treatment. Those in the treatment are less likely to think that individual factors are important, and they're more likely to think that structural factors are important. Like in the previous graph that I showed you in which we looked at uh, uh, comparisons across countries, uh, in all countries, more people think that individual factors are important than think structural factors are important. We see that here as well. But that gap has now narrowed uh, based on responses to uh, uh, priming on the issue of economic inequality. Okay, to talk now about redistribution, this is the question that I showed you earlier, the flat trend, the low and flat trend line over time in support for government redistribution. This is the question that is asked in the General Social Survey, which is the main survey uh, in the, that's used to study these issues in the United States. And we've also uh, fielded it in Sweden, where Arvid comes from. Um, and, uh, and we've replicated these questions as well. Um, and not only in 2015, but in, in, other, um, in other years, more recent years as well. Uh, this is a nice question because it, it asks about the agent of redistribution, the government. It, it, it talks about um, the target of redistribution, which is income differences. It mentions uh, groups at the top and the bottom, the rich and the poor. And then it also mentions the mechanism of redistribution. So raising taxes on wealthy families and giving income assistance to the poor. And then this is the scale one to seven. Now, what we did is we, repli we created this new question that is a parallel question that we thought, um, well, we hoped would be a, a very careful comparison of people's support for government redistribution as compared to redistribution in the labor market. So we substituted major companies for the government, pay differences, so earnings differences. We substituted for income differences. For the rich and poor, we substituted uh, executives and uh, the pay of unskilled workers. So the question is, some people think that major companies ought to reduce pay differences between employees with high pay and those with low pay, perhaps by reducing the pay of executives or by increasing the pay of unskilled workers. Others think major companies should not be responsible for this, reducing the pay difference. And this was also asked uh, of the respondents in the survey experiments. So you see here the response in, again, in the black bar is the inequality condition and the gray bar is the control condition. And we find that there is a significant increase in support for both government redistribution and business uh, and labor market redistribution. That is that businesses have a responsibility to re re reduce pay differences and government has a responsibility to reduce income differences. I should say that the strong version of our model of, of uh, uh, the opportunity model um, of beliefs about inequality and redist redistribution would be that we would only find this effect for the redistribution in the labor market and not for government. But what we're finding is that this response to uh, rising economic inequality and then the questions that come before these questions about redistribution, they answer the questions about opportunity. So we also think that they are being primed not only by the increase in inequality that they read in the article and see in the chart, but then they're answering these questions about the restriction of economic opportunity and then they're at answering these questions about redistribution. And we're finding that, that, um, that they are more uh, supportive of government redistribution as well as redistribution in the labor market. But you'll also see that the level of support for uh, business responsibility is higher uh, than the level of support for government um, uh, responsibility or, or redistribution. So in that sense, that is supportive of our model that there is uh, greater support for uh, a type of redistribution that redistributes earnings and pay rather than post-tax and transfer income. OK, I also wanted to give you a little bit of uh, information about how this plays out across uh, partisan, partisanship. Um, so these are just simply uh, um, descriptive statistics from the General Social Survey. 
And you see that among independents and Democrats on the left, uh, that there is, you know, slightly higher, but virtually the same level of support for both of these kinds of redistribution. Whereas the big jump that we get in support for labor market redistribution overall is among Republicans. And in other research, we find that Republicans actually do want uh, income inequality to be reduced. Um, but that the method that they, that they favor, uh, that they're much more likely to favor, is redistribution by major companies. This is a comparison that we do with Sweden. So we, we have uh, uh, fielded these questions in Sweden as well as in Denmark, but I'm just going to show you the data for Sweden. And what you find in the first uh, row there is the data that I showed you earlier about the, the relatively low level of support for redistribution in the U.S. that hasn't changed over time. So that's about 47%. And in Sweden, the uh, answers to the equivalent question, uh, 67% of Swedes support government um, redistribution. So that's a very large difference. That actually goes all the way back to the very first slide that I showed in which the U.S. is an outlier internationally in terms of its very low support for redistribution. The second line you see, though, is the question about uh, whether major companies should redistribute earnings. And we see that the share that support that type of redistribution is virtually the same in the U.S. and Sweden. And then in the, the third row, we combine support for either major companies or government redistributing income and pay. And we get a combined uh, share of 66% of Americans who support one or the other form of redistribution compared to 75% in Sweden. So the, the difference between the U.S. and Sweden has uh, declined substantially. And uh, that is mainly due to the fact that there's a large group of Americans, about 20%, who uh, support redistribution in the labor market, but do not support government redistribution. Whereas in Sweden, most people support both kinds of redistribution. There's much more overlap uh, in those two groups. Uh, do you think I should show this slide? <laughs> I, uh, let me, like, I, I could potentially come back to this. This takes a little bit of time to, uh, I know Conchita really likes this slide, <laughs> but uh, it takes a little bit of time to go through so I can come back to that. I, I'd like to wrap up um, actually and, and take questions. Um, okay, so uh, summar summarizing so far, um, there's a widespread assumption uh, of Americans as tolerant of inequality, as free market ideologues, as anti-redistribution, but those uh, beliefs, those assumptions uh, are inconsistent with uh, some of the data that I have presented. Uh, of course, not inconsistent with all of the data. You know, I don't want to go all the way over in the opposite direction here and paint too rosy of a picture. Um, but uh, it's this, these sorts of assumptions um, uh, and labels uh, of American views and perceptions, I think, are inconsistent with a lot of the data that I presented. Uh, first of all, the causal effect of rising inequality on perceptions of restricted opportunity, so an increased perception of uh, structural barriers to getting ahead, and also an increase in support for redistribution, both government redistribution and labor market redistribution. We have majority support for labor market redistribution and strong majority support for educational spending, which has been connected in prior research I've done to increasing concerns about inequality, as well as uh, strong majority support for a combined social and labor market redistribution. Again, going from less than half to two thirds of Americans who support one form of redistribution or the other. Anti-government views do not uh, equal anti-market interventionist or reform views, uh, perhaps uh, reflecting a kind of default support for not only growth in the market, but greater equity in the market. And then also potentially less political polarization around labor market redistribution. I showed you some of the data around partisanship, so we have fewer uh, differences across partisanship in support for labor market redistribution. The new research that I mentioned that we're doing now uh, that is not written up yet shows that when people are, sh are, are, um, are shown the treatment information about rising economic inequality, the exact same treatment and the graph as well, uh, and then we ask them about uh, the factors, other kinds of factors in getting ahead that have to do with race and gender and ethnicity we're finding that people are actually also more oriented towards 
thinking that there are greater structural barriers for racial minorities and greater structural barriers for women. Now, we're not replicating that across all studies. We've done four studies, and we're, and we're changing the wording of the, of the questions. But in two of those studies, we find significant treatment effects where people view that there's greater uh, structural barriers, there's greater um, uh, restrictions of opportunity for other groups in society that we think of as, uh, as being sort of the targets of a backlash. Uh, we're not seeing any kind of backlash, uh, even in the studies in which we don't find significant differences for the treatment. We do not find whites, for example, believing that, well, blacks uh, get ahead um, in a society in which there's greater inequality, or women are more likely to get ahead. No, we're, we're not seeing any effects, or we're seeing a consistent uh, a perception of barriers for those other groups as well in a society with high inequality. So that's why I'm saying potentially less political polarization around uh, the idea of labor market redistribution. And finally, uh, let me quickly just um, speculate uh, a bit. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, we uh, suggest that um, the problem uh, in the United States, I think, with high uh, and rising levels of inequality is not fundamentally because Americans embrace high levels of inequality and don't demand uh, greater redistribution, but that elite politics uh, has not responded to some of the demands that uh, Americans would make um, about desiring greater, inequ uh, greater equality within the labor market. Um, and that uh, elites have sort of woken up to the issue of economic inequality, but do not have any kind of unified message uh, about how to solve the problem of inequality outside of a post-tax and transfer approach. That's the standard approach, but we actually don't think that that works in Europe, probably either, um, but definitely not in the U.S., uh, so we see this more as a supply side problem rather than a demand side. The supply side being the, the, the political elites and institutions are not supplying the kinds of options and agenda that would meet um, the desires of the public for greater equality. What could fill this kind of void? Uh, possibly more of something along the lines of civil and economic rights model of redistribution. Uh, in the U.S., the model of, re um, of redistribution, if you will, to solve gender and racial inequality has focused on integration in employment, anti-discrimination. It is, it, is, it is a model of equality within the labor market, within employment. And we think that's much more consistent, I think, with the way Americans think about this issue. And I, I, I think it is something that is not only, that doesn't only apply um, to the U.S. Uh, thirdly, uh, it's certainly possible. We're, we're looking, as I said at the very beginning, we're looking at, we're interested in how people think about the issue. We don't necessarily think they're right. They could be absolutely wrong. Um, so we do have to ask about whether or not public preferences are viable. Uh, and whether or not a new par paradigm is needed. For example, some people have suggested that, um, that uh, we should just um, forget about any kind of form of inclusive capitalism or inclusive growth and instead just resort to basic income grants uh, because the economy of the future, a high-tech economy of the future, is not going to be able to sustain any kind of uh, greater access and equality within the labor market. So that's sort of option three there. But other options could be that there would be greater government regulation of business and norms uh, to alter pay settings. So there's very high support, for example, for the minimum wage, raising the minimum wage in the United States. So that's one form of government regulation. Uh, but it's limited. It has a limited impact. And it's been very popular in the U.S. over the past few years. So a lot of local areas are increasing the minimum wage because it's not being increased at the federal national level. Or perhaps I mentioned early more of a social investment model that focuses on, on, on education uh, and human capital development rather than uh, redistributive uh, transfers as the main government-based solution to uh, reducing inequality. But I will leave it there. Um, uh, thank you very much, and I, I look forward to your comments and questions. <laughs>